Thank you to Kevin Chen, Mario Marianovich, Moose, Pans Away, Pav2, Pushy Chouquette, Zachary Crumroy, and Zed Liu for all the financial support. If you've ever read or heard anything to do with war, you've probably come across the following words just kind of thrown about. Tactical, operational, strategic, and grand strategic. So today I thought I'd give a brief explanation of what these words mean for those who don't know, and add some historical examples to relate them to. These four words refer to levels of planning and military activities. The smallest is the tactical level, and can mostly be summed up as battles. If there are two armies fighting to capture, say, a city, that is on the tactical level of things. It is intended to fulfil, primarily, a singular military objective. The next level up is the operational level of things, but to help explain it better, I actually have to quickly jump to the level above it, strategy. The strategic level is basically your end game. It's what political objectives you want to achieve. So, with this in mind, we can look back at the operational level. This is the link between the tactical level, that referring to individual battles, and the strategic level, that being your political objectives. If the strategic level is what you want done, then the operational level is how to get it done. Military operations consist of many battles, the tactical level, and work towards fulfilling strategic goals. There is also the concept of grand strategic, which is a level above strategy. This is a long-term political goal, like maintaining global power, towards the fulfilment of which you make strategic plans, and it includes economic, foreign, military, and domestic policy. Often it will be far more global, or at the very least, very larger scale in its outlook, like restricting the global spread of an oppositional government's power as part of a so-called containment policy. The timing of all of these things varies wildly, but assuming that while the tactical level of things may last anything from a few hours to a few months if it's a particularly big battle, and the operational level could last anything from a day to months, and the strategic level could last from weeks to years, the grand strategic level lasts from years to decades. To give some real-world examples of this, I'm going to be picking two historical events. The first is the Normandy landings in 1944, during World War II, and the second is the Gulf War in 1990 and 91. For a non-military example, I'm going to pick the British government's post-Brexit foreign policy initiative from the 2020s, Global Britain. So, to begin with the Normandy landings, we can start with the grand strategic level of things, which, in this case, is linked to a policy called Germany First. The Allied governments were primarily confronted in the war by the German and Japanese governments, who had various allies across the world. However, the German government was deemed to be the greater threat due to its military and economic power. The Japanese government was going around Asia conquering lands for its empire, but in the grand scheme of things, this was not pressingly catastrophic for the Allied governments, and could be much more safely contained and pushed back against, with less resources and focus than the German government, who, if left unchecked, potentially, though very arguably, could have knocked the British and Soviet governments out of the war, and become the undisputed continental hegemonic power in Europe. The Japanese government, meanwhile, though it was stealing all of the European and North American government's colonies, was not in much of a position to do that at all. As such, the Allied governments decided to focus the majority of their military, economic, and political power against Hitler's dictatorship, in order to defeat them first, after which they would turn their focus to the Japanese government. The Normandy landings in 1944 were part of this grand strategic plan to destroy the German government's empire and force them out of the war, before the Japanese government. The strategy behind the Normandy landings was multi-sided, and included things like liberating France from German government occupation, destroying German military power in Western Europe, and taking pressure off of the Soviet government by launching a second front, 
on which the overstretched German military would have to fight. The operational level to the actual landings in Normandy was called Operation Neptune, with the goal of securing a beachhead on the continent from which the Allied governments could begin fulfilling their wider strategic objectives. These landings are much more famously known as D-Day, and took place on June 6th, 1944. To make things a little more confusing, the Battle of Normandy, which lasted from June till August and is known as Operation Overlord, had many other sub-operations which all worked towards fulfilling Overlord's goals. For example, in addition to Operation Neptune, there was also Operation Epsom, the goal of which was to break out of the beachhead established during Neptune and capture more territory near to the town of Caen. Caen itself was seen as a vital operational objective, because it had lots of rail and road networks running through it. Capturing these would have helped with communications and also logistics. On the other side, against Operation Overlord, there was Operation Liège by the German military, which was intended to counterattack US forces and recapture territory from them. As to the tactical level, this would be in battles which, in conjunction with many other battles, would fulfil the operational goals. So the Battle of Carenton by American paratroopers helped to secure a road and railway hub, while the Battle of Chambois was fought as part of an encirclement operation to trap the German military in something called the Falaise Pocket, in which they were annihilated. To move to the second example of the Gulf War, again starting with the grand strategic level, that being to maintain and consolidate US government global power in the post-Cold War world, in large part by working together as part of US government-led multinational coalitions against common threats to global stability. Strategically, the aim of the war was to force the Iraqi government out of Kuwait, re-establish Kuwaiti monarchy rule, stabilise access to Middle Eastern oil resources, and limit the capability of the Iraqi government to aggressively try to alter the regional power balance again, while also ensuring that they kept enough military power to act as a barrier against the Iranian government another opponent of the US government and many of its wartime allies. Operationally, the Gulf War can be split into two stages. The first of these was Operation Desert Shield, which sought to quickly deploy troops to Saudi Arabia in 1990 and have them in a position to defend it should the Iraqi government launch an invasion in the wake of the invasion of Kuwait. The second stage was Operation Desert Storm, which was the military offensive to push the Iraqi government out of Kuwait in line with UN Security Council resolutions. The four-day coalition government ground offensive in February 1991 was known as Operation Desert Sabre and was part of Desert Shield. To the British military, their deployment during the war was known as Operation Granby and to the French military, it was Operation Daguerre. For the Iraqi government, meanwhile, their initial invasion of Kuwait in August 1990, which sought to occupy the country, was called Project 17. As to the tactical sides of things, there's things like the Battle of the Bridges in the opening hours of the invasion of Kuwait in 1990, where Kuwaiti forces fought back against invading Iraqi government forces marching on Kuwait City. There's the 1991 Battle of al-Basaya between US and Iraqi troops to capture an important crossroads near to an Iraqi military supply base, and there's also the 1991 Battle of Norfolk, during which coalition troops fought against a Republican Guard division. To end with a non-military example, using the global Britain foreign policy idea, the grand strategic vision is to reassert the British government's global influence and create a new role for itself in a post-Brexit world, where its old grand strategic position as something of a bridge between the US and EU governments is no longer viable. Strategically, it seeks to establish or strengthen ties with other governments around the world, politically and commercially, as well as increase the global presence of British government power. Instead of being a bridge between both sides of the North Atlantic's governments, the British government, through open commitments to free market capitalist ideas, sought to make itself a more globally attractive destination for things like business and technology. 
It's a bit harder to talk specifics about the operational and tactical aspects of the global Britain policy, but we can see certain actions undertaken to achieve it, such as a military rearmament programme, especially for the Navy, in line with the theme that the 21st century is a competitive age, which refers in large part to the rising power and competition from the Russian and Chinese governments against the established powers like the US government. There's also been numerous attempts at trade deals with other governments around the world, such as the Japanese government in 2020, and an agreement over nuclear-powered military submarines with the Australian government in 2021. So, in short, tactical refers to battles. Operational refers to a series of battles aimed at fulfilling wider military or political objectives. Strategic, being the political goals of a conflict, refers to those objectives. And grand strategic refers to the much longer term aims and more nationwide allocation of resources to fulfil an overarching political goal, often with a more global outlook.